Remember source amnesia? That is, remembering some fact that you heard, but forgetting where you got it from. You forget the source, but you retain the information. That is a really big problem in our legal system. Let me explain a little bit of it first. One example of source misattribution or source amnesia, same thing. Source misattribution is when you attribute the source to the wrong you attribute some piece of information to the wrong source. Let me give you an example. It's called the familiarity effect. It's also known as the becoming famous overnight study. In the becoming famous overnight study, subjects simply read a list of novel names, names they've never seen before. No one that they know of has these names. And then later, they read the same names again, some of the same names again. If you ask people to judge which are the names, are names of famous people, the names that are familiar are the names that they'll pick out as the famous people. In other words, if you just read a name a couple of times, you, it sort of stands out in your memory and you assume, oh, I really remember that name, so that person must be famous. But let's think about it in a court of law. Let's say that you are a witness to your local, I don't know, Starbucks being robbed, okay? And they bring you in and ask you to pick out the person who robbed the Starbucks. You pick out somebody, but maybe that person is familiar to you, not because you saw them rob the Starbucks, but simply because you've seen them around in the neighborhood. Familiarity is a really big problem because we assume that we remember where the source is, where we saw that person, and we don't, right? You may have had that experience. You run into somebody and say, God, I know your face, but I can't remember where, where are we, I go to CSUN, did you go to CSUN? Or here's my job, I work at JCPenney's. Did you ever work at JCPenney's? We forget where we heard the information, where we experienced it. So, eyewitnesses will say, that's the person who committed the crime, when in fact, that's simply a person who used to bag their groceries at the grocery store. Now, source amnesia, or the misattribution effect, wouldn't be a problem if we were really good about saying, mm, no, this information comes from this source, and that information comes from that source, and I'm not going to combine them. But we accept misinformation, wrong information, all of the time. So maybe you learned about some fact, um, you know, um, almost 300,000 people as of today uh, have died of COVID in the U.S. Okay? But then you hear the president say, oh, that's fake news, or um, those numbers just come from the fact that we do a lot of testing. Any sort of comment that dismisses that fact. Later, when somebody asks you about the number of deaths, you might say, oh, I heard it was uh, 300, but 300,000, but I, I know that's fake. That's fake news. What you remember is somebody said it was fake, who said it was fake, right? So it turns out that we can easily remember someone else's memories. If you and I sit around and talk about what we remember from March, when the CSU system decided to take all of our classes and make them online, if you and I shared our memories for what happened, I might remember some of your experiences as mine. And you might remember some of my experiences as yours because of source misattribution and misinformation acceptance. So how does this happen? Remember we talked about reconsolidation in the previous lecture? Okay, I've got some memory of some event. You asked me about it, so I retrieve that information. When I retrieve that memory, it's fragile again, and any other information that is present at the time that I retrieve it, including my opinion on the person, for example, that gets included in the memory as it gets 
reconsolidated in my brain. So for example, you may have had a friend who you thought was just the greatest person ever. And then after a year or two, you find out something horrible about them. Okay? That is going to contaminate all your old memories of that friend, the old good memories. It's going to change the way you remember that person forever. So lawyers and police officers, anybody who asks questions of eyewitnesses can easily, even unintentionally, change the eyewitness's memory by wording questions in a particular way, introducing new information, all of that. It is even possible to implant a memory in someone else's brain of an event, of an episodic memory, of an event from their actual life. All right, let me tell you about a really classic study on implanted memories. When somebody puts a fake memory in your head and you remember it as a real memory. Here was a study. You recruit college students for a study on memory. And unbeknownst to the college students, you call up their parents and ask them to describe major events from your life. I don't know, maybe the first time you rode a bicycle or something like that. Then when the subject comes in for the study, you tell them what you did. Oh, I talked to your parents, they're lovely. They said that when you were a kid, you um, fell down a slide and broke a tooth. Do you remember that? Can you tell me, tell me more about what happened? What's your memory of that event when you fell down a slide and broke a tooth? Okay, subject tells you that. And then you say, oh, there's this other memory that your parents told me about when you um, first saw a cow and you thought it was a dog. Do you remember that? No? Okay. How about, um, let's see, when you were graduating from junior high and you um, slipped on a banana. Do you remember that? Oh, yeah. Tell me more about that. Another story, and this is a key part. Another story your parents told me about is when you got lost at the mall when you were a kid. Do you remember that? No? Didn't happen? Oh, okay. We'll put that aside for later. And then the subject, or the experimenter, just puts it aside like no big deal. But they're going to come around again a second time and ask you about these memories again. And then in the study, they're going to come around a third time and ask you about these memories again. And each time they circle around to ask you questions about your memories, they're going to ask you, do you remember the time you got lost at the mall? What happens? Well, the first time you ask a student about to remember getting lost at the mall, I'm sure there's more details added, the first time they're not going to remember being lost at a mall because it didn't happen. But the second time around when you ask them again, a small percentage, let's say 18%, will say, yeah, I remember being lost at the mall and here's how it happened. They'd never been lost at the mall. They just experienced an implanted memory. 25% of the subjects in this study, when the experimenter came around a third time and asked them again about all their memories, 25% of the students said they remembered having been lost at the mall. 25% of these students just experienced an implanted memory. Okay, what does that have to do with the law? Sometimes police officers, when they um, find a suspect, or a witness, they will ask the suspect over and over and over again what they did on that night, right? So maybe you went out to McDonald's um, and uh, got a burger, but the police think that at that time you were robbing the Bank of America. And you go over every time, no, I was at McDonald's, I got fries and a McFlurry and a Whopper, uh, no, not Whopper, um, Big Mac. And the police officer said, no, 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 you went to the Bank of America, right? And you did this and you did that and you did this other thing. You keep going around and around. You keep saying, no, no, no. Yeah. But they keep circling around again at telling you about the robbery at the Bank of America. 
Some people confess to crimes they never committed because eventually they remember having committed the crime that they never committed. It's just like this study where 25% of the subjects remembered having been lost at a mall when they had never been lost at that mall. How can you increase the likelihood that someone will remember an implanted memory as a real memory? You just show them a picture of them at that age. So here's a study. In this study, subjects had the implanted memory of having placed slime in their elementary school teacher's desk. Okay, so it was the same thing. You recruit the subjects, you call the parents, you ask them about real events from their life, and then when the subjects come in, you ask them to recall these real events. And then at some point you say, and your parents told me about the time you placed slime in your elementary school's teacher's desk as a joke. You want to tell me about that? Oh, you, that never happened? You, didn't, you don't remember that? Okay, we'll just put that aside for now. And you circle around and around. In this study, they had two sessions. I think they were about a week apart. I could be wrong. But... You're asked repeatedly, and then you come back another day, and you're asked repeatedly. If you show people a picture of them in that elementary school class, you don't have to show them a picture of you putting slime, of them putting slime into a teacher's box, just a picture of them at that age. You can increase these planted memories from 25% to two-thirds of your subject. Ah! The majority now. The majority of people are remembering something that never happened. That's a problem for the legal system, folks. It's a huge problem. Now, adding on to that problem is the fact that we are ridiculously overconfident in our memory. We think that our memories are accurate descriptions of what actually happened. But I've just given you five different ways in which they're not. Here's a real problem for a court of law. How confident someone is in their memory is unrelated to how, to how accurate that memory is. Let me say that again. The accuracy of somebody's memory is unrelated to how confident a person is in their accuracy. So somebody can tell you, I'm absolutely sure that that's the criminal. So another uh, eyewitness might say, you know, I think it's a criminal. The guy who says he's absolutely sure is no more likely to be correct than the person who says, I'm not sure. Eesh. Now, here's a, another problem. Processing fluency. If a memory is easy to remember, something about it makes it easy to retrieve, then the ease of retrieving, or the processing fluency, makes us more confident in the memory. Now here's the problem. False memories, things that are complete lies, tend to be unusual or unique in some way. You've heard the truth over and over and over again. So when someone tells you, oh, did you hear that the, I don't know, Libertarian Party is actually running a, a child pornography ring out of a pizzeria in Washington, D.C., that's very memorable. It stands out. So we are more likely to remember fake news than real news when that fake news is unique or different, and it usually is. We have more confidence in fake memories than real ones. I'll leave you with that here. Come back, and I'll make you feel even worse. <laughs>